Well, thank you. First of all, thank you. So many people have turned up, many more than we expected. So thank you so much for that. And thank you, Estelle, for um, agreeing to come along. That's wonderful. Estelle, love it. Um, I'm going to start off with a small um, workshop. It's a virtual workshop. You don't need any materials. Only one person in the audience has already done this workshop, so I'm quite happy to... <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind, that is Laura. Um, it's a difficult subject, the mother, so I want us to get in the mood. So I would like to take you to where I go when I think about things, and that would be with maybe a pencil, with charcoal, with some sort of drawing material. So we're going to do a small drawing. There's not a lot, enough space to do a large drawing, so keep the drawing quite close to you, but certainly use your hands. So you visualize, you've got your charcoal, you might select a pencil. Close your eyes, please. Close your eyes, close your eyes. And imagine the face of your mother, the shape of the face. Pick up your pencil or your charcoal uh, and draw the, uh, basically the geometric shape, whether it's a circle, an oval, a shape to resemble the face. And now the shape of the hair. Decide, is it a bun? Is it uh, long hair? Is it shoulder length? Does it stick out? Is it close to the face? Draw that shape on top of your oval or your circle. Come on, get those pencils out, some of you. <laughs> now, uh, on top of that hair, you might, you might decide the neck and shoulders are quite close to the circle of the face, or there might be quite a long neck there. Is it quite hunched? Is it quite close? Is there a neck at all to be seen? Now draw in the shoulders. So you've got the shoulders, you've got the face, you've got the hair. And now perhaps think of your mother's eyes. Were they large eyes, small eyes, close together eyes? The eyes are about a third of the way down the round circle of the face, about a third of the way down to almond shapes, perhaps long shapes. Perhaps they went down at the corners on the outer edge or down at the corner on the inner edge. And now trace from the eyebrow, maybe the left eyebrow, trace the shape of the nose. And under the nose, think about your mother's face, the mouth, shape of the mouth. I'll give you a minute or uh, uh, 20 seconds to just put in any detail that you might want to put in. To start to bring your drawing to a close. Maybe a little fleck in that pupil of the eye, give it a little bit of life. Okay. So, just a few people finishing off here. So when you're ready, put your pencil down. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'll start my presentation, which is I'm going to read a paper that I've already given, actually, in two venues in Berlin. Um, one was a university, but a psychoanalytic university. I didn't know such a thing existed, but it does. Uh, the other one was at an art school. So. 
after, we've, after I've read this presentation, which will take about 25 minutes, 30 minutes maximum, then um, Estelle Lovett will ask me some questions she's prepared. And between those questions, it'll be open to the audience for about another half an hour. So um, I'm going to start. I notice when making a work, I enter into another mental space, into what feels like home, a timeless yet energized zone, with the hope that the work may outlast me and yet contain some of this timeless energy, reverie draws me into the contemplation of that energy, that space of timelessness, and into it examining notions around its frame of reference. For this paper, I look at where I go when working and what precedes this activity, its personal, cultural, and historical context. Before embarking, I have the impression that the work was already there, in the ether. It, I gave it form, but the work preceded this given form in time and space. It came before me and goes on after me. It doesn't live and die as flesh does, as it is all but an instinct that is given shape and form and becomes an inanimate object. However, the work, once seen, cannot be unseen if it evokes a previously unthought of thought, and that new thought cannot then be unthought. In that way, it lives on, becomes part of everything, and is ingested into the culture. The desire for immortality is embodied in the work as something of the immortality of our energy. Energy, as Einstein said, cannot be created or near destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. I feel that something of this indestructible energy is harnessed and built into the work. Could it be that this energy embodied by the work is the same energy accessed by the viewer in a non-religious yet spiritual, spiritual yet secular sense? My intention for each work is that it be the best of me, or indeed better than me, and my human frailties and failings. Said with the apprehension of making too grand a claim for it, the work becomes perhaps a God substitute for me, in line with Saint Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God as the best of what man can be or can imagine being. This idea, of course, goes back to Aristotle and his suggestion of God as the unmoved unaffected by anything above him. I ask, could it be that the art object is unmoved in its inanimate state, however, it has great power to move another, emotionally speaking? The inanimate object we call art is unmoved while we hope for it to move others. Art remains unaffected, loved or hated, even if an artwork provokes an extreme reaction resulting in the art being destroyed, its image remains. Its concept cannot be unconceived. On the other hand, we project onto these art objects something of the sacred. They become deified in the secular churches that we call museums. They become sacred objects in the imagination of the viewer. And as artists, I think we believe that the work will save us perhaps from some things in life, but ultimately from death. I have an on ongoing need to look up to my works, that they rise above my height. This need I trace back to the cradle from where I saw my first images and to the streets where I saw my first unfamiliar or unheimlich objects. This is the experience of all of us, but sometimes I wonder if, for some of us, the awe experienced in processing images made us want to become artists. Did these first seen images become the uncanny, the stuff of art? What was it about the impact of these images that inspired the artist to dedicate a life to revivifying the image? Is the thing we are looking for to contain our emotion, to hold us, to be unmoved or strong in the face of our reverie, the very same thing we got from the mother 
is the mother a sort of container for this need for the unmovable, the safety of the all-powerful? When I say the mother, I mean the invisible and the unsacred mother, the domestic mother, absent from the Trinity, who we can, however, accept via the art object. Does the art object also unconsciously stand in for the mother as it overtly stands in for the sacred? Does she come into our psyche through the back door of the sacred via the container of our emotions or beyond or bions, container contained and Winnicott's concept of holding? It seems that God the unmoved meets art the inanimate in terms of what we consider sacred. Is my muse out there, biblically speaking, or is she in front of me? In whose image am I? As artists, we are driven from the inside out, responding to our gut feelings, which we then rationalize and give a voice to. Are these gut feelings operating as drives, which are filtered through the greater weight of the cerebral processes? Our feelings either processed into thought or repressed so that they may emerge as desires, artworks, without the consent and without the consensus of the Freudian trio, id, ego, and superego. Many of the works I'm about to show you have been made from woven steel wire, mesh known as chicken wire. I make structures that are stable and self-supporting, involving the process of crumpling and twisting, cutting and shaping this non-solid, almost ethereal material. This description could also perhaps be applied to the process of constructing a psyche. I made the works for Mother Mold during the past year or so, following a corresponding project called In the Mold of the Fathers. The final realization that my mother was my greatest influence inspired these works, which feature the mother as muse. In the title, Mother Mold, I'm thinking of my mother as my maker, forming me from her body, shaping me, feeding me with her thoughts, her words, and with her food. A fragile affair, a first love affair, mother and child, teetering on the edge of the known, deeply buried in the unknown. The realization that beyond the cultural need to demean the mother, it was she who was my maker, to whom I owe my greatest respect. Thinking about being born and meeting my mother for the first time outside the body inspired the work titled Poetic Encounter, which is in that room. To make the larger wire ball required a mold. The mold was made from newspaper covered in fragile tape. You can see here both the mold and the wire ball in progress in my studio. I decided to make the mold into a sculpture in its own right, giving it the title Mother Mold, described its function as the former or mold for the larger of the wire spheres used in the resulting installation, Poetic Encounter. The probe-like hole in the center represents the all-seeing, the omnipotent, and ever-transforming -transfor concept. Our interpretation of the omnipotent has shifted from the church to the state, but for the purposes of my discussion, the interesting shift is through psychological rather than religious or political understanding. The shift is from the father as container of all that is nurture, God, to the Kleinian mother as breast and burden, either suffocating or negligent. Turning from the Kleinian mother to my own mother, who was as conditioned by the grand narratives as was her mother before her, I was, of course, also educated by the same phallocentric codes prevalent in our shared cultural heritage. These coded messages became the stories I told myself about the gods and the other cultural father figures. They took away my reality, my reality, which in fact looked down on me and I looked up to. This work makes me ponder the idea of Winnicott's transitional object, the child's use of her or his first possession, like the blanket or soft toy as a substitute for the breast or the mother herself, in the child's aim to become separate from the mother. I wonder if the transitional object then becomes the father or cultural fathers. Do we ultimately substitute the mother with the father as caretaker and nurturer 
in our aim, in our aim for independence from the mother, transferring her qualities at first onto the blanket or soft toy, and then onto the fathers as comforter, through Father Christmas all the way up to God the Father. However, was the one required for our survival from the beginning, not the mother? I find it interesting that psychologists reinforce the idea that the mother is often the enemy. A large percentage of psychologists are women, so this judgment simply, ser this judgment simply serves to condemn them in turn, along with the rest of us. The implication is that the fathers were also victims of the mother, or at least the innocent party in the family saga. Perhaps we collude at the psychological staging post when the libido searches out its other. Somehow we learn this desertion of the mother as figure of influence and authority, and indeed even nurture in its positive sense. Although the iconic mother, Mary, of our Western cultural heritage stands for nurture, is it not this very trait from which we are said to suffer psycholo psychologically, or should I say suffocate, when in her hands? That is to say, can we be nurtured to death by the mother? in that her suffocation can lead to our own demise, mentally speaking. However, the expectation is reversed when the same quality of nurturing, being loving, forgiving, etc., serves as a description of the qualities embodied by the Father, who then rises to, to become akin to the Holy Father, for example. Dependent when born, we instinctively search out Saviour, and when I looked up, I saw the breast. My mother, she was cl the closest thing to an omnipotent God to me, and she was in my image. My mother and my paternal grandmother were, in fact, my main authority and influence. As mentioned earlier, I often look up and wonder what I'm looking at or for to be envelop enveloped, perhaps, by something warm, emitting light, the sun, perhaps, or the feeding mother, which I think must be related to old memories of looking up from the cot, pram, or lap. In Eden's need, I wanted to address this ancient shared archetypal experience. That's the title of this bottle, Eden's Need. To bring it to life, to animate the sculpture with the addition of light, Eden's Need is a phonetic palindrome that pairs one meaning with another to express that yearning for things, both spiritual, like the Garden of Eden, and physical, like a nice glass of red wine. And not least, the longing for childhood, perhaps lost, or my mother, also lost. The female of the ancients was seen as connected to the moon, and so on some level epitomized, and so on some level epitomized as the dark side. Perhaps fear of this very connection was, and still is, at the crux of the division between us, in a primal sense, I mean, between men and women. The moon as we see it, a compressed form containing its other side, serves as a primal, nightly reminder of the fear of that other side, that absence, that unknown, that ghost, perhaps. The three-dimensional form, the sphere, as opposed to the disk, has no binary division of front and back. Freud said that extreme opposites contain each other, like eros, thanatos, ego, id, much like God, devil, good, bad, etc. For example, Adam does not encompass the good and Eve the evil, although the language may contradict this. One contains the other. Evil contains Eve, phonetically speaking, and Eve contains evil link, uh, in a phonetic and linguistic sense. And evil contains vile, well, nearly, I just added that bit in, actually. <laughs> I made this giant duo-headed condensed vessel from raw clay, and I cut it into three sections and fired it in my kiln. One head contains the other, like fratricidal brothers, like Cain and Abel, or indeed, like mother and child. 
The fired clay operated as the mold for its mesh, mesh other, both part of and yet separate from one another. I think making a sculpture from a mold presents a poetic echo of the way families are an assemblage of molds and the molded. Duo, duo head, the title of the work, the solid form, which is sometimes exhibited alongside this ethereal, transparent counterpart, present a yin, yang, to and fro of the real and the illusory. Ding Dong is one of the works I made while musing on being conditioned by all the voiced yet unvoiced matter, the way a bell continues to chime, whether you want it to or not. One part of this work, the bell case on the left, is called Ding, and the clangor on the right, Dong. That was perfect timing. <laughs> They are often displayed as separate from each other. The resonance of the bell without function still holds. The form of the bell is, of course, subject to interpretation, but it is architecturally associated with its bell tower. I find it interesting that the bell closed within the tower is rather like the breast when strapped into the bra. Both the breast and the bell provide feed, one for the body and the other for the soul. Interesting also is the idea of the bell in the tower as heard and not seen, which is playfully converse to the Victorian idea of the child as seen and not heard. Following my predilection for pairing objects, subjects and ideas, this coupling of the found and the made allows me to bring together objects from my collection. Of evocative, oh, same. Following my predilection for pairing objects, subjects, and ideas, this coupling of the found and the made allows me to bring together objects from my collection of evocative ephemera as parts of my works. This aspect of my work has resonances with the work of Louise Bourgeois and the way she worked with personal objects to make them immortal, while sculptors like Anthony Gormley inspired me in his use of his body and materials to capture imagery, and Helen Chadwick in the way she brings out her past through her works, which seem so evocative of mother and child in their abstractions. Conflicting ideas pass down to me like history, imprinting on my psyche, often and they often take me back to my childhood and the mysteries of my parents. I consider the one and the other, the male and the female, and the gender of God. These are the preoccupations for my works. A work I made which considers the journey of, these, of those artists of my gender in my time is called Facts of Life, that is, the journey of a baptized female artist in the 21st century. It contains six balls placed to form a triangle. With its enmeshed symbolic objects from a watering can, a wine glass, a soft toy, and a rubber glove to some strands of my hair trapped in a bottle, it signifies staging posts in the journey. The full title for this work is Facts of life, birth, baptism, bitch, domesticity, disappear, and death. I'm hardwired to analyze. I love that Sigmund Freud said that for him, stones speak when referring to his collection of antique sculpture. I try to allow my works to speak. It is perhaps our human way to record for posterity what dominates our consciousness. However, my psyche and its unpicking is my project. Forgotten memory, with its egg-shaped form complete with yolk, contains a child's shoe at its center. The shoe is obscured and difficult to focus on, rather like the process of remembering long ago or a dream which goes in and out of consciousness. The egg is seated on the steel frame of a chair designed with the fully formed human in mind. However, seating the egg in the chair reminds me that we still contain, contain deep in the psyche that egg we once were. Food is my metaphor for nurture and has become a much-used device in recent works. 
I find it interesting that the word feed has many connotations, both high-tech and low. The word feed is, due to, is used to describe processes in the technological world, like the feed of information via the virtual highways to the physical intake of food. This work feed looks at our first experience of food as being part of our mother's experience. It is clear that we are molded by our mother's experience since birth. However, in reality, we go back to the egg. It was at our conception that we had our first feed as an egg. So if our mother's woke and had egg and bacon, that was our first feed. <laughs> to feed is a continual transformative process, beginning with the mother, to heed her subtle cues, which we ingest along with her mother's milk. I made feed while contemplating the human as egg and the egg, which is then fed to us as sustenance. Finally, our need for sustenance as a creative act, transforming, transforming itself into something else, perhaps art. So in conclusion, exploring the process of conceiving a work how a notion evolves, what prompts it and what precedes it, I have focused on the mother figure and her authentic presence. The point being, she is the mother that we are all born from, male and female alike, and yet we take this so much for granted and we have so little concern for her. So very little is made of this amazing phenomena and of these women who mesmerized our fathers and molded their sons. In my entire career, in talking about my works and life, I have rarely been asked about my mother. I can, in fact, remember the one and only occasion and who it was who asked me. It was Dr. Nellie Thompson, an analyst of the American Psychoanalytic Association, who asked me this question after one of my presentations. I credit Nellie as the person who gave me the permission with her question and the authority to make a focused inquiry on the very important question of the identity and currency of the mother. What is the currency of the mother outside her role as replicator or mold? What of the mystical and spiritual perception and emotion, empathy and tenderness as female attributes? Love's Tender, the title of this piece, considers ideas and definitions around the concept of tender as a sentiment and also as a kind of currency, not monetary, but a currency of life itself. I utilized the seed of nature in the form of the pine cone, which could be seen as nature's currency, much like money is our currency. The work displays an ambiguity, the housing of the pine cone tenderly held and at the same time trapped in its nest-like form made from twisted steel wire. This twisted wire, which traps objects like thoughts in time, serves to pin down some facts or certainties. The work seed takes the form of the fruit of the sycamore tree. We call this fruit containing the seed of the tree a helicopter in colloquial language, perhaps due to the way it turns on the wind. The work is in intentionally unfinished, suggesting fragility, movement and space. It's, uh, it's upstairs on the back wall. Seed is a portrayal of the beginning, the finished and the unknown, the cycle of time, timelessness and the mother the beginning and the end, the end. <laughs> Thank you. That was fascinating. I'm sure you'll all agree that um, what's extremely interesting, one of the things that's extremely interesting about Jane is that her work is not just intellectual, it's extremely emotional, and being here in this gallery space tonight is almost like walking through um, an installation that is more than a personal family album. Um, it's very revealing, and it's re revealing to all of us, not just about yourself, but also about ourselves. So I congratulate you on that. Um, and thank you for introducing us to your mother. 
Um, I think it would actually be very nice because we know about your father mm. and we know about your great grandfather. And I think it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about your mother and also your paternal grandmother and the jam sandwiches that you so enjoyed with her when she picked you up from school. Well, you know, you've remembered that very well, but with a little detail that's different. They were not jam sandwiches. Oh. They were <laughs> Danish pastries. Oh. She called them Vien <laughs> Viennese walls because she was from Vienna. But it had jam. Uh, no. Viennese walls, they have a sort of cinnamon type cinnamon, of... Cinnamon, yeah. okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so my mother, and I mean, I said in the talk that she was my greatest uh, influence. I mean, how could she not be? How could she... How could our mothers not have been? It's ridiculous that we think any other way. But uh, uh, my grandmother, my father's mother, my paternal grandmother chose my school, not my paternal grandfather. So the women seem to making all the decisions. So she, this school was right next door to her house, very handy. But I had to go a long way to this school from Paddington on the bus to St. John's Wood, say age five, alone. <laughs> but um, it, it, she picked me up every day from age five to eight. Um, is that what you were referring to? Just hmm. tell a little bit about the actual facts of the matter where that she was there and she was like a second mother in a way. So I had these sort of two mothers. Um, yeah. So this, this is obviously, it's not just your mum, but also probably your grandma as well. Yeah, this, this is all the mothers really. All mothers. Like my mother, my grandmother, your mothers. You know, just thinking about the mother, it's so strange what happens to the mother. <laughs> I think it's so bizarre how she gets sort of substituted for something else and all her qualities get sort of co-opted onto other figures like Father Christmas and uh, <laughs> God and all these other male, you know. Uh, very nice, a lot of men here and I really appreciate it and I think you're very, very <laughs> brave. You're very brave. Thank you so much. Um, but I, I still want to be able to say these things about how I feel about the mother, you know, and uh, I really appreciate that... Uh, father or, or, or his mother is reading a book, I think. It's so beautiful, that painting. Of his mother, yeah. yeah, absolutely yeah. But beautiful. we're talking about my mother now, so no, no co-opting it to talk about my father and his beautiful painting. No, no, not no, allowed. No, 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 what I'm saying, that your, your paternal grandmother... Yes, she was beautiful. She looks beautiful, and yeah. It's yeah. such a lovely painting. I'm just talking about her now and no, not about his skills. Well done, Monica. <laughs> What's the difference, do you think, between making a sculpture that is um, made of a material that you can see through, so it, it almost encompasses the interior, and of course we associate women with interior spaces. If you go right back to the Dutch Golden Age, you know, women are in interior spaces. So whilst your sculptures are, um, are metaphors um, for, for women, mothers in interior spaces, as well as lots of other things, how do you feel um, having them in the 3D makes them different to perhaps a drawing of Oh, your well, mother? I like that very much, Esther. I mean, it's Estelle. I really hadn't thought or considered the fact that the transparency of the works is uh, a type of analogy about being open. You know, women are open emotionally more, perhaps, and these works are... Um, are, uh, well, they have everything embodied in them. They have the beginning, the middle, and the end all seen at once, if you know what I mean. So they're transparent in that regard, which I think is a very nice metaphor for this type of thing about the quality of women as emotionally more open with each other, perhaps, and generally with themselves, maybe. And also, ourselves, ourselves. also it's, it's um, quite extraordinary that, that you've made them... I mean, obviously, you know, being a woman, I'm bound to say that we are the better sex, right? And the strongest. But, um, you know, to make them out of something like chicken wire, I mean, I, I know when I've tried to handle it as a student and, and you get nicked and you get cut and, and yet you, you've made them so very gentle looking. How, how, how uh, did you manage that? You know, I haven't analysed that, but it is a bit of a battle, you know, and I like the 
I like the relationship, taming it somehow. But perhaps, perhaps it has some male qualities, and I'm taming it or something. Um, I, haven't, I like that. I like that reaction you have. I haven't thought about that. It seems so, so easy working with chicken wire in contrast with great big bags of clay, massive forms, heavy that I can't carry, that do my back in, that I have to lie in positions to get inside the outside them. You know, that one of these works, the mold, the, the one, this one, I had to lie uh, on my back, this one. Uh, I ha uh, these open, and I got inside them, these works, to work on them. I mean, I was looking through the eye, the other eyes open, of the eye of the work, but it's very, uh, it's very much more, for me, physically demanding, and I just think, as you get older, you just want something light that you can carry. <laughs> that, oh, again, it might be a bit of a battle and a bit scratchy, but oh, it's much nicer for me. It's a much, much nicer way of working. Um, you know... I can, I can manage it, I, can I have a relationship with it where I can carry it from one room to another. I mean, it's idyllic, I can't. This was my intention, to look up to my works, but for them not to take me with them, you know, physically, like do my back in or, you know, I wanted them, I wanted it to be the sort of relationship with sculpture that, you know, one artist can have with her work. Not, I didn't want the big team of cranes, you know. I wanted uh, a very personal, a tactile, a very tactile person, and I like the feel of things, which is very odd because I've made these feel beautiful. Actually, some of them feel really nice, <laughs> others not. But uh, that was my intention to make them feel. Uh, I was going to say, funnily enough, um, these works I actually feel like going up and embracing them, cuddling them, which perhaps I shouldn't do unless I want to buy it. <laughs> but yet, you know, I feel as though I do want to take yes, it yes. towards me. That's so interesting because um, with the bottle when it was on the floor, uh, I, ha I have some students sometimes in my, in my uh, studio. And uh, one, uh, I said, oh, when she came in, I, s I had my arms around it. I said, oh, do you feel like this, this need to <laughs> hug it? Is it my mother? Why am I doing this. She said, oh, I so want to do that, thank you. She did it, but the next one came in and said, uh, oh, quite the reverse, I find it quite terrifying. Oh. So, uh, oh, I thought maybe that, oh, but she, she then went on to say she went to boarding school from age five, so she was, uh, her mother was a, maybe a strict uh, teacher or uh, authority figure, not a loving mother who'd sent her. So it might have been something psychological, mm. but there is that. There are, I, I have it too with the big the, So I may, the big I may do that afterwards. Just go and hug one you of the might. sculptures. <laughs> Please don't pull it down. No. <laughs> Actually, how... Because more than just sculpt, uh, being a, a sculptor, you're, you're sort of like a, um, an engineer or, or an architect. I mean, how do you get these to stand up? There's no armature. It's almost... Um, force of will. Magic. Force of will, yeah. Force of will. No, when I decide something, I make that thing happen. I'm very good at that. No, I, I don't give up until it... Yeah. No, but you make it... I mean, you, you're jesting, and, and it's almost as if you're sort of poo-pooing it aside. But no, it's, I'm not. I, I mean, the fact that they're not falling over is extraordinary. The skill that you have... Mm. Oh, well, um, I don't know. Uh, I just think there is that. All of us artists in the room, and I'm sure there are many, we make something that we want, we see it and we make it happen. We make it happen. There's always a way. There is always a way. And I think um, it's just a question of persistence. Um, What's your thought? And, and, and trial and error. The engineering bit comes out of trial and error. I'm no engineer, but you can actually <laughs> simulate. The, well, it probably takes a lot longer and less maths involved, but... Um, do you do Certainly. lots of sketches? You, do you no, work no, from, no, no. You just, just do it. If it doesn't work, do it again. I do a thing. Uh, and usually it works. You, as you're going along, you know, oh, look, the balance. Oh, oh. you move with it. It's a relationship. Uh, I never do uh, loads of sketches. I do loads of sketches for the next thing and then the next thing, which turns into something else anyway in the making, you know, with sculpture. Um, it um, happens like that. And um, what about then, the, for example, the, the, the um, pieces in the Facts of Life, which is the, the um, mesh, but inside you've got a rubber glove and you've got a bottle and you've got a bit of your hair. I, I sort of imagine you um, uh, sort of like Joseph Cornell in that you've got a box of stuff 
that you've accumulated over the years, you fill mm. the house up with, and, and you know, you sort of rummaging through it and sort of think, oh yes, that will go with that, or how does that work? Um, well, I go out and look for it, the thing. I need something and I look for it. I look around my studio first, uh, it's easier, and then I go out and I generally, I mean, it sounds really tramp-like when it's dreadful, but <laughs> I'm quite uh, discreet about it. <laughs> and I just look on the floor and it's usually there. And if it's not, it will be in a junk shop. And if it's not in there, it will be in a skip. I know a few skips around the area. <laughs> so I just go and look for it. The thing, I don't know what the thing is I'm looking for, but I know there's something that will say, for example, in this piece, um, well, you can't really see the objects inside, but like the rubber glove, I found it in my kitchen cupboard, you know. I mean, the, I was perfect, domesticity. I thought women's work, whether it's art or any other form of work is always seen as domestic. I mean, even Margaret Thatcher, when she ran the country, she went around on one occasion with a shopping bag or something like, in a really domestic sort of shopping way, talking about housewifery. And I thought, well, it doesn't matter what you do, really. <laughs> it's always going to be seen. You might as well run with it. So um, got the rubber glove in there. Is it, is it important that the objects are not new, that you haven't gone out and bought them, that they've been used, yeah. in inverted commas, by yeah. somebody else, that, that they've belonged and exist through somebody else? Not that, but that they present themselves. Right. I don't want to design. They have a history. I don't want to design them, so I want them to present themselves. So, I mean, they might... I don't think it's about the new and old so much, but they do look more interesting, older objects that have got the marks of time on. Yeah, they, they do look generally they look more interesting. But I think it's much more about the objects presenting themselves randomly. If you go into a shop, it's quite a different experience. It's different to looking in the gutter. You know, it's quite different. Um, something else happens. There's too many associations with shopping or something. <laughs> I don't know. But remember the audience. You can come in at any time, too, um, if there's something. Uh, save your questions. Yeah. You, actually, you've actually, got, I, you've just, got, I just want to yeah. ask something else again, because you're talking about the mother, and of course, um, you know, if if we follow the New Testament, then our mother is Mary, and so the most famous of mother and, and child um, images or sculptures is, of course, the mother Mary and baby Jesus, and sort of wondered how would you feel, because of course, before before art galleries, before Gazelli Art House there was the church. You know, the church was the first gallery. And the Pope, well, Mrs. Gazelli Art would be the Pope today, you know. Um, so how, how would you sort of feel? I mean, can you imagine that sort of in St. Paul's or something? It's a contemporary well, no, but mother I often and child. Ex I often exhibit in churches. I think it'd be exhibited, exhibited in three, three, three churches, yeah. So, so. something like this, how... how I mean, I think that's extraordinary to have something like this in um, a very traditional church um, where it's a very contemporary subject matter and it's also very animal-like, uh, you know, this sort of trunk-like shape and, and umbilical cord and the rope. Um, yeah, you I, know, like, I like the idea. Yeah, but churches are very open to contemporary art. I mean, mm. they really I've exhibited much more out there things than this. I suppose what I'm trying to uh, say is that yeah. this should go there. Yes, so. I know. Yeah, I think you, I, I love the idea of making it really big and having it like on the altar or something. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Very sacrilegious. Because it's got nothing mm. to do with religion, has it? Nothing to do no. with religion at all. It's to do with the mother. I really yeah. It has absolutely nothing to do with politics, religion, or anything else. It's just that oh, I don't want those things. Because I was baptised, I'm quite uh, oppressed by the idea of religion. So I don't want that to stop my freedom of thought. You know. So I play with the idea in a way to liberate myself. Yeah, yeah. Th these are more spiritual yes, th than yeah. religious. Yeah. They're for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you believe or not, yeah. they're for people that just like sculpture. Yeah. Or uh, art. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, I loved your question, Estelle. Thank you so much. Has anybody got any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I know we're not supposed to ask this, perhaps, but uh, <laughs> we were talking about your your mother and your grand grandmother. But obviously, you're very famous also because you're the great. You're, you're the. You're the 
Yeah, great granddaughter, yeah. Great granddaughter of Sigmund Freud. So where do you see the uh, psycho analyst uh, sort of psycho thing uh, connection between the mother and the children so biologically it's 50 50 in terms of dna but in terms of the connection between the mother and the child uh, has that influenced your work because in in the gallery literature it, it said it did but you yeah. didn't want to talk about it so can we talk about it now and well, what is the influence exactly are you asking me uh, what the influence my mother has on my work no your your grand Father, My great great father. Well, I think it's in the way I analyse, um, for example, the use of the material. I have thought, is it that I feel quite hardwired to look analytically, which I think I've got from my great-grandfather, and I've used this very hard, well, it's hard to handle wire, and it's quite, um, it's quite uh, spiky, you know, it, it can cut you, as it were. So it's sort of hard wire, you know, it's not an easy soft wire, it's a hard... Why but leaving aside the materials that you used, is there no other connection? Because that's, that's not much of a connection. Well, I think it is a connection that I feel uh, psychoanalytically driven. I think that's the DNA that does that, isn't it? That um, makes, you, uh, makes you have a predilection for one thing rather than another, you know? I think, so a, I, I uh, think as well that, that to, to have... Um, you know, we, we don't need 100 million connections, I suppose, to the past. Um, they're evident, and we finish the works ourselves by bringing our own personal baggage to it. So however much we know or do not know about Sigmund Freud will either help the work or not, but I think they stand up on their own. Um, and it just so happens that Jane is related. I mean, other than that, Jane is creating works of art that speak to all of us, um, and we all go through psychological uh, tendencies where we think we know or think we don't know and disagree with ourselves and agree with ourselves and it's forever changing. So I, I don't know how important it is really to hook it on to your great-grandfather oh, totally. That is crazy, isn't it? Because my mother, it was her. Mm. She fed me with her milk. She looked at me with her eyes all the way through, all the way through. She talked to me, don't do this. Who is on my shoulder? It's not my great-grandfather. It sort of is in a strange way, but in reality, because it's my fantasy, isn't it? I like that. It's much, much more interesting. But it's my mother there. Don't do this. Do it like that. No, get the, the, the. You know how mother's telling you off the whole time. That's who's really there <laughs> telling you how to be. Yes. yes. I feel like your pieces sort of nurture the whole concept of, obviously, the mother and domesticity and the tr traditional role of the women in the home. And do you, do you feel like that? Do you feel like it's... A, you know, I feel like you might be trying to support... The mother? Know, the, uh, the mother at home no, in a modern no, way. No, 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 I don't know anything about it. I mean, I've never had a child. I mean, personally, I've got two stepsons who I adore and I love them. But I no, I never wanted to get married and have children. No, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in my mother's relationship with me. I'm not interested in <laughs> being a mould myself. I'm just thinking, look, what a, what a fortunate thing that someone was, that I exist, that all these amazing women do this thing. I, I think it's extraordinary, because I could never do it. No, I just want to make my work. I, you know. I'm at all interested in that. So, yeah, quite the reverse. So, but I support and admire all those who do, from my mother to every, every other one who would sacrifice. It's a martyr, it's a sort of sacrificial act. You know, it's much more the religious act, isn't it? One sacrifices himself. We talk about this thing in a religious way, but it's the woman who's sacrificing her life in a way. You know, it's very hard to do both, to do what you want and be a mother. Are you a mother? You're probably a mother. Oh, Whew. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. Now, you, <coughs> you talked about the, and you, Estelle, you asked <coughs> Jane about the connection with, the f strong connection that Jane feels towards Sigmund Freud. I feel a very strong connection to my great grandfathers through dancing music. And by I also have the very analytical side. So I think we, and by I do actually feel, almost feel the connection, <coughs> and I follow the path. So we do inherit certain tendencies like analytical thinking. Or 
it's sort of the fantasy. It is. Mm. Yeah. It's like I, the fantasy. I really feel very strong bond with my great grandfather's Swiss origin, whatever. Thank you. So I think it does exist. It's Thank almost you. subconscious. Thank you. Uh, do you feel uh, or do you find sometimes uh, the final outcome when you come up with that it's, it was more than you were expecting? Mm. It, it was a, more a stranger than, mm. and as you mentioned, instinctively, because as much as we may feel strongly about something, but the outcome, the physicality of the idea or the sort of entrapped or somehow in this physical uh, kind of material, it may actually be uh, uh, kind of has, has more than as to become a subject matter of investigation than we were having that thoughtfully or, uh, you know, mentally. I think so that, yeah, very, very well put. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it, well, has there been the cases that you, for some reasons, may have uh, I don't mean in a kind of strong sense of it, but just destroyed some works or there, were there works that you wouldn't display or you kind of, you thought that it's, it's not something that you would, uh, you know, agree. It's, it didn't happen successfully the way you thought, uh, not just in sense of, you know, uh, presentation, the way that it could be presented. Just you weren't happy and were there works that you, Destroy it, sort of. Do you know? I mean, you've just, you're obviously an artist. You've described exactly what happens. Yes, I'm an artist. Thank yeah, you. you make something and then it presents to you something you hadn't intended, which is more interesting perhaps. And then another time it shows you something you don't want to see and you can't bear to show it. Not at that time, but later. The time comes. I don't destroy the things, I just put them aside, but then I go back to them because you catch up with them, because your unconscious is running ahead of your conscious, if you know what I mean. Sometimes it may make you sort of react in a strong way because you're challenging and you want it to happen. And no matter what is difficult, even if it will fail or matter of like, you know, like a, as much as I mentioned, like destroy, but you still want to avoid that. So to happen because you have uh, there's such a feeling like there is the success when something is strongly, you know, challenging reverse. So it's kind of moment of discovering something new. Well, uh, it's difficult, isn't it, to know what's what, you know, at the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I I'm never so clear about why. Maybe I don't like something, but you obviously have this relationship where you know a little bit more about what perhaps. I mean, I feel you're talking about something specific here. I feel that. Well, I've tried to put in a general terms, but specific as a, that I, I'm, I appreciate that you agreed that the outcome may be really strange and that what we intended in initially. So it's, the outcome itself may be subject matter of investigation. Yes, but then that becomes exciting. Another. Exciting, yeah. yeah. I always feel excited if there's something new. Mm. Very rarely do I feel uh, uh, maybe horrified, but I have done. I'm not horrified, but embarrassed. <laughs> I have felt embarrassed by my own works. And that may lead to another for, for the next... No, usually so it's no, abandoned no. when I feel like that, because mm. I'm just not ready to go there, okay. maybe. Or the time isn't right for this type of, you know... Thank you. Thing. Were you, were you su surprised at your range of emotions that you must have had whilst yeah. making the works? Yes, I was, yeah. I didn't think I thought about my mother. Well, you know, I just took her for granted. I had no idea that um, that um, there was a body of work in there. You know. Have you ever cried while making a sculpture? Not while making a sculpture, funnily enough. It's like it liberates me into, or it protects me into that wonderful timeless zone where I'm happy doing what I want to be doing the place where I'm meant to be, all those things. So I'm not deeply emotional when I'm making because I'm just thinking, oh, I'm transfixed. This is sort of other time, you know, that time I was talking about. There's a sort of energized space that I feel very good like that, better than doing any other thing, yeah. I have an idea when it comes to your head before. Would there have been an idea on the sculpture? Or afterwards, do you, does it get to To make you cry? Do you know that's such an interesting concept? It takes you to another place, uh, Monica. One that 
almost objectifies the emotions. You know, that sounds harsh, but not in a harsh way, in a way where they're held in water, like where everything's in abeyance, where everything's okay. No, 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 I don't ever feel that we're making work, no. Which is not that I don't feel amazingly spiritually lifted, no, I feel that, but not like emotional in terms of wanting to cry or let out emotion. It's almost as though the emotion is being held or something, held, I don't know. Contained. Contained, yeah. Sorry, I just had a question. Um, you talked about religion. <clears throat> uh, with regards to that, do you think you can be open-minded if you d discount all religions? In Hinduism, they talk about, Sri Aurobindo talks about the mother a lot and spirituality, etc. I mean, but you seem to brush the whole thing aside, saying, oh, we don't want religion. But, I mean, I've studied art and Christianity. I'm not a, I'm not a Christian. It doesn't mean I'm not influenced by the... Are you an the, artist? I'm not an artist, no. Uh, I'm an investment banker. But uh, what I'm saying to you is that why totally just say, oh, it's nothing to do with religion, thank you very much. I mean, I'm it, only an artist, Sarling. I'm only yeah, an artist. I can't, be, but, I can't but take on be, everything. But you could be influenced by various things. Yeah, I, but you want me to be. I have no, to I don't be want true. you to be anything. I have to be true to me and just be who I am and do what I do. I can't, yeah, I can't that, do everything. I can that, just that's do, what you, yeah. do what I can do. And, and I think that's where I come from. I don't try and cover everything, make sure everyone's all right. Yeah. I don't care as long as I feel... I'm being who I am and try my best to work out what's going on. It's fine. And that's who you are. That's fine then for me. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think you've achieved that. They're extremely honest pieces. And I thank you for letting us into your private world and sharing it with us. It's very um, brave. It's extremely, from my point of view, very humbling to, to be allowed to experience them. Um, and they are extraordinary, extraordinarily strong and extraordinarily gentle. And I feel as though I know a little bit about your mum now, <laughs> more so than what I've read in the books. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, I don't know if anybody else has got one last question or if Jane would like to. Oh. Um, Jane, um, there's a piece upstairs, the one, Do I Look All Right? Um, yeah. And it's not that it's out of kilter, it's very much in kilter with the rest of the work. But um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that work and how it came about. It's, uh, I mean, for me, it's got a real kind of tradition with the kind of objet trouvé, you know, kind of ready-made, and it's really playful, as all the work is. But I just wondered if you could shed any light on how that came about. I will, uh, Lawrence. Um... Oh, it's interesting, because as you were saying that, I found uh, a new... Um, well, I had a new thought about the boots in the work. You know, it's an abs frame with my old boots on it, and I was thinking, well, that's a term used for... derogatory term used for women, isn't it, often? Old boot. <laughs> old boot. <laughs> I hadn't really thought of that. Because <laughs> I, I think I spoke about it on... The, we had a Sunday breakfast talk, so I think I spoke about that work, so I was trying to think of something new. Uh, and... Uh, it came. So basically, I bought for um, my son, my stepson, um, Craig. Well, Peter bought him an abs frame. We sort of buy the Christmas presents together. <laughs> but anyway, um, he chucked it in the bin. <laughs> and I found it in the bin outside, you know. And I took it back indoors. And um, I thought, oh, that was actually quite expensive. And... Um, it still hasn't been taken out of the packet. He obviously didn't... You know, the plastic was still on it, so <laughs> it's very clean. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'll talk to him about it later. <laughs> <'cause in the laughs> and anyway, I brought it back in, and um, I thought, well, uh, that, uh, probably he didn't want that at all. And actually, why am I projecting onto him all this, you know, do I look all right business? He's quite happy with his body as it is. What on earth are we thinking of? He obviously didn't want that. So um, <laughs> I started playing with it and trying to put it together, and I thought maybe he couldn't put it together, or maybe he didn't want it, maybe it's too much of a job to put together. So when I eventually put it together on the floor, I thought, whoa, this is great. You can do thousands of things with it. It's got so many permutations. <laughs> and then um, I don't know what made me put the boots on it, 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, I should have gone to it to show you it. Oh, it's gone off now. <laughs> but um, it's upstairs, so those who haven't seen it, I put two boots on this frame, and it just looked so witty to me. And so humorous, and it wasn't serious, but my husband came back and said, oh, I love that new work. <laughs> love it, love it. Love it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, could I? Could I? Is he giving me permission in that? You know, because before I might not have considered it. But he sort of gave me permission by saying, you know, I love your new work, so that's why it's in the show, really. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you're trying to get it back on? Oh, we can show you the work. Anyway, so if you do have a little walk around after, you'll see it. Um, was it going the other way? Oh, there it is. There it is. Oh, oh, did it go down the other way? There. And I just, and, and, and in, a, in a way, it's like, um, you know, when women are giving birth and things, it must be terrible. You know, it's like, oh, what the indignity of it. And they must think, well, do I look all right? <laughs> Quite a lot of good that's going uh, <laughs> So I thought so many, and I thought an ant, if it's looking at us as humans, if an ant is called, we all, oh, it's that type. Doesn't matter if we've got our fineries on or we're very scruffy, two smaller creatures like insects, we all are of a type. So it's all about perception and the gaze and who's looking and... Uh, the subtleties of perception, you know, this is a big difference, isn't it, between your fineries and your... <laughs> but um, if for another species, there's those, uh, those things are just vanities on our part, not, there's no difference. We are just a hu that animal, not even a human, that's that one, yeah. They're those that step on us, you know. It's lovely um, that, we, that, that you've given us the chance to contemplate, to be a little bit sad when we think about our own mothers, to laugh with you. You've given us all these emotions. That's interesting, yeah. We've gone from misery to laughter. <laughs> 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 yeah. I think that's what I like to do with the works, because they're quite, they're quite heavy and they're quite deep. And I, I like to introduce humour, because I, I feel everything's OK, you know, everything's... Mm. Everything's fine, everything's worked out fine, and I enjoy my life, and, you know, my mother and I had a good relationship, and so, yeah, I, I like to introduce some humour, so it, it's digestible, really, otherwise, <laughs> I think it would be too heavy. What, what are you working on next? Can I ask you that? Oh, well? gosh, I've got this sort of uh, holy grail <laughs> going on, it's quite tall, it's probably... I just want to go higher. I want to look up. I'm going <laughs> higher. It's a really long, tall holy grail. It's going to have an egg in the top. Yeah, that's what I'm working on at the moment. And a sort of like, it's this thing I found in a junk shop. It's like a, a bull, but the horns had broken off one, one side. So I'm adding, it's very tiny, but I'm adding big chicken wire. I don't know if they're going to be horns or what they're going to be. Or I'm adding these things to it. And it might be like a helicopter, like wings or horns. I'm not sure. I keep thinking, what am I going to do with this? It's going to be too heavy. It will still hang on the wall. It's got a thing to hang on the wall. So how much weight could it actually take, this little tiny wooden, carved wooden little ball? Small. But, it, you know, I like relief, and it's a relief. It's a, not a basso relievo, but it's... Um, like over halfway, you know, alto relievo. It's a high relief wooden carving. Actually, a really nice little thing, actually. It's been hand carved. And so I want to keep it and treasure it and make something, make it into something. So that's what I'm working on some big thing and some little thing. So to keep. That was one bit of advice my father gave me work uh, on different scales, don't stick to the same scale. Vary your scale. I don't know why it's good advice, but I've taken the advice, and so I do. <laughs> I do a small thing, a TV work that I can do in front of the TV, and a large <laughs> thing that I can, um, you know, look up to, something like that. What, what about material or fabric? Yeah, I don't know about that. My mum was a fashion designer. She did painting for her first part of her. Then you had to do it in two halves, then your, deg your degree, like a DPD and a something else thing. And anyway, two years painting, the next two years fashion. So because she was always with cloth and beautiful clothes hanging on rails, half finished for us, and you know, I don't know, it seems a bit motherly somehow. To me. Fabric okay. is, isn't it? Yeah, a bit domestic. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I like it or not. I keep thinking it would be nice and light and 
but I'm not quite sure. I like metal. Metal, metal yeah. Metal and uh, clay, and I like the very soft, the very hard. I quite like this sort of quite extreme thing. Well, I don't know. Not sure about material. I mean, you never know. I don't like to rule anything out. No, never say never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's some soft toys in some of the, you know, there's a soft toy in one of the... I've made quite a few, actually, Mila's seen the works I made with soft toys. There's a soft toy in the middle of one of those that stands for bitch, like, it's like when we learn language, so the female learns language, that we are the female and man's best friend is the dog, mm. and, like, if it's a female dog, then it's a bitch. And somebody pats your dog and they go, is it a... <laughs> is that a male or a... <laughs> so, there is always that thing about the language. Oh, who's that? got that wonderful laugh. Where's it coming from? Oh, was that you? Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Or? <laughs> thank you. Actually, I'm sure you'll walk around with people if, if they'd like to have a look at the work now. Yeah, please yes. have a look at the work. There's catalogues if you want from the last show, if you're interested, if anyone's a student or what's interested. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, there's more drinks upstairs if you want to drink. Yeah, please have a look at the exhibition. And thank you so much for all coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.